Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. Ty Hildenbrandt here. Dan Rubenstein over there in beautiful Brooklyn, New York. Solidverbal at gmail.com is our email address. 206-338-1784 is the phone number that many of you called last evening while watching all the games of the weekend. Of course, a lot to get through here in just a few moments as we go through all of Week 13's action. Dan Rubenstein. Yo. You are, you are back from uh, the Iron Bowl. <laughs> I'm back from Madison, Los Angeles, and Tuscaloosa, yes. But now I am back and not in the studio and on the friendly confines of my couch. So who? So there was a football game down there I, yesterday. Uh, mm-hmm. Not much of one, no. There was a tailgate that fed me and had me come across all sorts of wonderful young ladies. Right. But, um, How was that much of a game? It was good. I'm real old. Yeah. There's a two next to my age, and I still mm-hmm. felt really old. Um, although you're older now, aren't you? Yeah, I was going to say, wait till you get to the threes. It gets even harder. I can't do that. Um, no, it was really fun. It was a little colder than I've, I've been to. Uh, it, it, I guess it was colder than previous games in the South have been, but it's this late in the year. It was in the, I don't know, 40s, 50s. Uh, sure. So the sundresses weren't there, is what I'm trying to say. People were properly... Uh, warmed up, but it was a it was a fun time. A lot of food, a lot of attractive eye candy, uh, a lot of passionate SEC fans. It was a fun time. Yeah, and they're all on Twitter too, by the way. And the passionate SEC fans, of course. <laughs> they are. The last uh, few hours have been exciting here as a Notre Dame fan, for all the obvious reasons, and then of mm-hmm. course the uh, ensuing arguments that have broke out across the Twitter and the internet, <sighs> wherever else. We'll get into that a little bit here on the solid verb. But we would, of course, be remiss if we didn't start off this show by bringing, uh, uh, without bringing you the reverbs that we received re- 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 I could not play most of these, Dan. i got to be honest. A lot of drunk <laughs> messages, a lot of things of that ilk. Quite honestly, it's just... Just unintelligible? Out. Yeah, I mean, a lot of incoherent speech mm. in these reverbs. Isn't that what we pretty much do as well, though, to be honest? More, yeah, more or less. Yes. More or less. Let's have a listen. All I gotta say is, party in the city where the heat is on, all night on the beach of the break of dawn. Welcome to Miami, Benvenido. I'm- hey, this is John in Melbourne, Australia. This is Brandon from Frederick, Maryland. Hey, what's up, Dad? This is Rolls Royce 5. Mm. Hi, this is Joel from Iowa. This is Matt in Kentucky. David from Columbus. This is Josh from Grand Rapids. CM Shack, Victor McCackalack on Cackalack Crime. Offense didn't boom, nor did it shake a lack. And I'm just looking <laughs> the immortal words of Florida Evans. Down, down, down! Did anyone else notice Friday night the Scholar Athlete of the Week who has a 2.88 GPA? <laughs> Urban Meyer is a Galactus Destroyer of Worlds. Braxton Miller is his herald. Just wait till next year. I think Teddy Bridgewater broke his wrist, and I'm just here to tell you that if that's really true, there's going to be lots of crying. Six points and a loss. Good to see Rutgers is already embracing their role as a member of the Big Ten. Yeah, so uh, I watched the Iowa-Nebraska game, and then I decided, hey, why not shove glass in my eyes? If Iowa State ever had a potential Heisman winner, it'd be Sam Richardson. Richardson for Heisman, baby. I think you forgot when you were reading off a lot of Josh Boyd and the statistics, you forgot the uh, important asterisk for the uh, ACC. I ran a marathon on Ohio State's bye week last week, and it probably took less out of me than the Michigan game did. <laughs> I swear, there's a whiny coach on Arizona State and a cool common collected coach on Arizona. I could have sworn it goes the other way around. I'm not used to this. A certain state running back whole team is a better record than a new team. And as a petty Penn State fan, it makes me feel great. Fail to one dimensional offense. Fail to the second half zero. Fail, fail to Michigan. The Buckeye State's the best. Just signing off with the last War Eagle. But, oh my God, Notre Dame is going to the title game. If it's so easy to go undefeated, why don't the SEC teams do it? If it's so easy to go undefeated, why can't Boise do it in the Mountain West, which they're obviously a good team in a bad conference? Next chance, one loss, BCS, Orange Bowl, baby! How is it that a team that's 500 in the Big 12 
goes to the SEC, and all of a sudden is a top-10 team. Because you know if a 500 team in the SEC went to the Big 12 and was at the top of the conference, we'd never hear the freaking end of it. And there's only one thing left to do when the whole thing thing. i just like to thank God the troops. Troops. And Newton's mother's womb. Obviously. This is Ty Hildenbrandt. We'll see you in Miami. Ah, there it is. Mm. We will see you in Miami. Notre Dame wins on the road. It's 12th game of the year. Yeah. 22 to 13, your final score in the Coliseum. Notre Dame, of course, 12 and 0. USC drops to 7 and 5 on the year, which obviously poses its wow. own set of interesting dilemmas now as we head into this offseason. Um, first and foremost, what was your game watching situation? Because I know you were uh, oot in a boot. Where, uh, were you able to watch the games at a tailgate or at a bar, or what was what was the situation down there in Alabama? I'm just now catching up on. I just raised my mic so you can hear me more delicately. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just now starting to catch up on some of the morning games. I just had to because I was out working and filming, sure. but was able to read as much as I could and watch as many highlights as I could. Luckily, the morning games really did not affect the national championship race or really too much conference. Uh, high-level conference activity, but um, filmed until what time was kickoff? Two, two thirty. For uh... it was local time. It was two thirty in Alabama Auburn. Got back right. in time to see the beginning of the two o'clock and two thirty. So that's three and three, three thirty Eastern game. So Florida, right. Florida State, Oregon, Oregon State, uh, Alabama Auburn. So from that point on, I was able to see pretty much everything in front of me, whether it was streaming and on TV. All right, so by now you know that Notre Dame's headed to Miami. What? This is news. Um, USC appears destined for the Sun Bowl, <laughs> where you could assume that they will murder the dead, lifeless corpse of Virginia Tech. At least that's the right the assumption here. What was your takeaway? Because I have many, and I saw I saw some of your tweets. I can't say I appreciated all of them, but that's okay. We're we're friends here. What um, what was your takeaway? After it really is feast or famine. The the Notre Dame game. What what do you think? Sure. It was as Notre Dame a game as as exists and has existed all season long. The defense was ridiculous. Uh, made huge plays. Uh, Manti Te'o was the be- probably the best player on the field, and that included a field that Marquis Lee was all over. Um, takeaway was that. I'm still disappointed that Notre Dame isn't able to do more offensively, but they are the most dangerous team at this point in America on a, on a one-game setting to go on the road to USC. Granted, a USC team, not with Matt Barkley, but Notre Dame's great. Notre Dame's outstanding. It's near impossible to go undefeated in college football. I make snarky remarks about their November schedule and how disappointing a season of Big Ten, ACC, Big East stuff has been, but... The takeaway from the specific USC game was they were able to hang well enough, well enough as expected, and any, any team can be expected to do with those receivers. Um, and they're great, and I can't wait to see them against a great team. And I, I package that in snarky ways, like by the time they play... <laughs> uh, by the time they play... I caught that, I caught that. yeah. That was, um, good. That was uh, good. An SEC team in the national championship, it'll, it will have been two and a half months since that D has played a ranked team. And that's honestly... That's not Notre Dame's fault. It's not right. that, I mean, they, they, yeah, they saw the November schedule and they figured they'd be ending with a top five team in USC. And then you have Pitt in Boston College uh, and Wake Forest. Uh, it, it's disappointing that you wouldn't get to see this Notre Dame team on a bigger stage with more stakes for both teams, as we've seen with a lot of top teams in November. But that's nothing they can control. Um, so I'm very excited to see this Notre Dame team get tested. Uh, it just it sucks that it's after so long that we have the layoff. Continue yeah, now. Your I, thoughts? Yeah, no, I I agree completely, and I I agree pretty much with everything you just said. And from my standpoint, you know, I mean, as I alluded to, there are a lot of SEC people out there right now singing the high praises of the SEC. And did you know Notre Dame would be the seventh best team in the SEC? And we won't mention it. Everyone's everyone's allowed to make their own arguments. The argument to me is silly, why you'd even make that, because that's not the way college football works. And actually, that's not the way pro football works either. Okay? The, the, the New York Giants a couple of years ago could have gone 16-0 and in the NFC West. It doesn't matter. That's not how you play the games. And sometimes the best teams don't even emerge 
right. from a playoff. Even if Vegas says they're the best teams, sometimes they're not the ones who win based on matchups, based right. on whatever else. So all those arguments to me are, are very silly. I am extremely anxious to watch this Notre Dame team against either Alabama or Georgia. And no disrespect to the Georgia people watching. I'm sorry, you misspoke and said Alabama or Georgia. They'll be playing okay. Alabama. Okay, okay, continue. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Whoever it ends up being, I am I am very curious to see how Notre Dame fares. And it's it's not because I think Notre Dame is especially better than either one of those teams. I have a number of reservations and a number of reasons to be a little bit cautious in what I say regarding that matchup. But right. I do think it's going to be interesting to see what Notre Dame does against a, an SEC team, the SEC sure. champion. That, Much that, in the same way other teams in the past, whether it's been Ohio State or Oregon, teams that have been sure. explosive in their own conferences and, and the, the interest we have in them playing SEC teams. Sure. Absolutely. And it serves as a really good measuring stick. Again, we, we run into this every year. We didn't see it last year, of course, because there was the Alabama-LSU game of the century part deux. Right. But it, it will be interesting again this season to see a... I'm about to be shrouded in holy light behind me, by the way. I don't know what that is. You're, I'm going to move getting, this way a little yeah. bit. Very okay, good. continue. Much, much better now. It's, yeah. It's because it's we're talking Notre Dame. That's, That's what, what I'm saying. So, anyway, I want to see how Notre Dame fares. Notre Dame took no risks in the passing game here, and I think if, if you watched the game, and I know you did, I saw a lot of commentary on this. I Honestly, Notre Dame dominated most of that game. It mm-hmm. was until they got down to the 20-yard line. That was that was sort of where it cut off. And it was a stark contrast from last year when they were in the red zone and they just turned the ball over. This time around, they just couldn't score. They couldn't score touchdowns. Right. So the secret and silent MVP of this game was Kyle Brinzo who kicked five field goals. He was the mm-hmm. reason won ultimately because of the points he puts on the board. And then they had a pretty good game plan, I thought, towards the end of the game, just running up the middle. Running up the doing to USC what other teams have done very effectively against USC, running up the middle with theoretic. And it was really all it took. It really all is it took. there? Uh, this is me nitpicking, and we have a lot of games to get through. But since sure. the Notre Dame is the story of the weekend, does it concern you that USC scored eight or Notre Dame scored one touchdown against a USC team and a USC defense? This is me playing devil's advocate because once yeah, again, yeah. Notre Dame is outstanding. You have to specify, of course. I get it. Okay, That's what Notre, USC's defense, which has been pretty atrocious these past few weeks, is allowing twenty-four points a game. Notre Dame scores 22. They score one offensive touchdown. This is me nitpicking, but as a Notre Dame fan, now that they're undefeated, the unquestioned number one team in the country, is this the biggest concern for you, the ability to be dynamic on offense, not just between the 20s but in the red zone? Absolutely. (laughs) Hey, if they score touchdowns last night instead of field goals, that game's not even close. It's not a nine-point game if they score touchdowns instead of putting threes up on the board. And, right. uh, you know, it works against a USC. Right. A USC team, by the way, that had a backup quarterback, who I think is going to be really good in due time. He's got a cannon, yeah. If he can, it lets the one thing Lane Kiffin actually does is develop quarterbacks. He doesn't know how to call a, <laughs> an offense within the five yard line. Was that funny to you, by the way, or was that terrifying? Um, no, it was funny. It okay, was, good. Yeah, no, it was good. Um, good. No, I think I think Max Whittick's going to be very good. And I, I made a lot of jokes on the Twitter about him last night, but he's he is going to be very good. Right. Um, it, it concerns me that they're not scoring the touchdowns because against a team with a better quarterback and presumably a better defense, you got to convert there. Right. And, uh, if if you don't convert on on plays like that, it's it's obviously going to be an issue moving forward now into the national championship against whoever. So that is true. You know, I, I hope they can get their act together. I am elated. Um, How are I, you during the game? A total a total train wreck. <laughs> Were you yelling at little children? A, a total train wreck, Dan. I watched with, <laughs> I watched the first quarter with a few friends, who all of whom were rooting for USC. Sure. I watched the final three quarters with Mama Hildenbrandt, and the only reason I did that was really to make sure she was still breathing because right. it was very intense there for a number of minutes in the football game. But we uh, we made it through, and uh, now I'm I'm hoping you and I can go to Miami. Um, not like as an item, but you know. Well, to- I was hoping for both. Right. Okay. Ty, can I can I put a blanket up over this window so I'm not completely shrouded go, in divine light? Go for it. I'll, I'll All right. Do, yeah, I'll do the voiceover work here as you. Uh, okay. Good. You'll you'll describe what I'm doing as I'm doing it. As you tent the theme, sure. So uh, as we mentioned, Notre Dame wins twenty-two to thirteen over USC on the road. 
Theo Riddick, again, 146 yards and a touchdown. Everett Golson, again, doesn't necessarily need to take chances in the passing game, but was very effective as a runner in spots. Brian Kelly used him the way he's been using him more throughout the second half of the season and had a, a lot of success getting key yards and just using him to extend plays. That's really what it came down to, and ultimately that's why Notre Dame ends up winning this game by nine, Dan, and they cover the point spread. That was uh, That's the big thing here. Cover the point spread. I know you and I had gone back and forth on this. Notre right. Dame covers the five or the six or whatever the heck it ended up being. Um, so that's that. Notre Dame has, uh, has punched its ticket. They will presumably square off against either Alabama or Georgia. You seem to think Alabama. Well, yes. Is that is that uh, your official? What's your prediction here for this game? For the SEC championship game, after yeah. Georgia lays waste to Georgia Tech in quite an impressive fashion, Aaron Murray has a very nice game. I simply think if you look at what Alabama under Nick Saban has fallen to, it's been mobile quarterbacks, Cam Newton, Johnny Manziel most recently, um, not as much in the LSU, Jarrett Lee, Jordan Jefferson situation last season. But that's, sure. that's what really, it's, it's a dynamic offense that is able to exploit with dynamic athletes. Um, I, I don't think Aaron Murray has the chops at this point. And granted, Alabama's secondary may not be where it was last season. I don't think he has the chops to beat this Alabama team down for four quarters um, because I do anticipate them being able to uh, stop Todd Gurley and Keith Marshall and love Malcolm Mitchell love yeah. George, what George's defense has been done has been doing in the second half of the season but ultimately I think the momentum right now from Alabama is going to be to, they're built to beat a team like Georgia so now were you in this game at all did you did you go to the Iron Bowl or did you go out to watch no I did not um a the tickets really expensive b the SEC does not credential SB Nation uh and c uh, I wanted to see all of the games. It was a huge afternoon of games, and I didn't want to just watch the worst of them all. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, yeah. Alabama wins 49-0. to nil. I saw uh, you reposted a tweet from Ivan Mazel saying that uh, he hadn't seen Auburn all year. How was that happening? And was stunned how far the Tigers have fallen. Um, newsflash, we knew this about four weeks into the season, Ivan. Um, yes. I like Ivan Mazel. I do. But uh, you got to be kidding me! <laughs> you got to be kidding me. He hosts ESPN's college football podcast. Right. A rival presume. podcast, a rival podcast, folks. That's what you're. That's what you're subscribing to. Right. Stunned at uh, how far the Tigers have fallen. We were right. there eight weeks ago, folks. So yeah. Uh, in this one again, as you might expect, Bama was running clock at the start of the second half. It led forty-two nothing. Auburn mm -hmm. gains one hundred and sixty-three total yards, and in so doing, essentially puts the finishing touches on Gene Chizik as it was just announced that Mr. Chiswick has been relieved of his coaching duties yep. for Auburn. Two years removed, 22 months removed, we'll say, from uh, winning a national championship with Cam Newton, Dan. This is, mm -hmm. uh, this is interesting on a number of levels because when Chiswick took over from Iowa State, there were a lot of Auburn fans, a lot of college football fans, really, who were very underwhelmed by the hire. And he came in, obviously, Cam Newton transformed the program for that one magical season. And ever since he left, things have sort of gone downhill. So I guess the question now is, Gene Chizik, um, a good coach because of Cam Newton or just a bad coach when he doesn't have him? Well, you, you forgot the name Gus Malzahn. I think that was key because you saw interesting things pre-Cam and you saw some fight post-Cam with Gus Malzahn, but it was not the same. That was, it was the perfect storm, Malzahn and, uh, and Cam Newton. And I think that's when we've, when we've seen Gene Chizik coach ordinarily and that that is to say without those two he is ordinary at best and perhaps awful at worst and it's not just in-game coaching it's the coaching hires he's made the way he's run the program has not been effective for continued and sustained success um i think it's fair i i don't know if the the timeline is necessarily the most fair but 22 months removed and being this low is it seems unprecedented. I don't have records and record books in front of me, sure. but to do it, to, to fall so precipitously in under two years to that point um, at that big of a school with the, with expectations that high, um, you get it. You do. It's, yeah. it's the reality of college football. It's why we pay attention because it's so intense, but at the same time, so silly. That's what's going to happen. 
Okay. And uh, we talk about Alabama winning in dramatic fashion. Yes. Not dramatic. But no, not at all. In a dominating fashion, let's mm-hmm. say. Over Auburn, Georgia does the uh, the same to Georgia yeah. Tech. This one caught both of us by surprise, actually. Um, Tech gets the doors blown off, quite honestly. Georgia yeah. had no trouble doing anything. I watched the first 15 minutes of this game, and I was like, huh? <laughs> Aaron Murray missed three passes all game. Girl Talk, Keith Marshall, each had two touchdowns. Right. Georgia looks good. I, I, I know you're not gung-ho on Georgia, and I don't know if I am either, but... They've looked much better, especially think, since we've seen how much better Ole Miss has gotten. Yeah. When we have a clear picture of their schedule. Uh, yes, Georgia did struggle with lowly SEC opponents like Tennessee and Kentucky, but um, since pretty much since November started, I'm, not, I'm trying to remember their exact schedule, um, They've looked like a team on a mission to, to be able to beat Florida and just confuse the crap out of Jeff Driscoll and then to beat decent to average teams. I don't know if, what the distinction is there. Uh, they've been quite impressive. Aaron Murray has looked very good. Uh, the running game has looked outstanding. And defensively, they they seem to have corrected a lot of the mistakes that they were making early on. So um, the SEC championship got a lot more interesting. But I don't know. I, I just – Alabama <laughs> – I it's tough to give Alabama second life and not expect them to uh, to take advantage of it. So right. they, will, they will play in the SEC title game against the Georgia Bulldogs. Plus Alabama with a bye week before the SEC championship game. Yeah, yeah that doesn't help. An um, iron an iron bowl bye week. Basically, basically. Yeah. Now, so I pulled this sound by the way. I'm going to play this repeatedly for the next few months. Oops, there. It is. Just that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I just want to get the yeah, 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 yeah. Part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So the winner of this game goes to Miami. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to play that at random points. We license that, by the way. That's right. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned the Florida Gators. Florida, Yes. a big win on the road against Florida State, 37-26. to 26. Florida had a season-high five takeaways, got a huge touchdown run after a turnover by Mike Gillisley, about 11 minutes left in the fourth quarter. It's what gave Florida the lead. Again, right after E.J. Manuel got knocked the F out. It was a hit. Gillisley ran for 240, had another touchdown on the day. Pretty much from this point forward, it went downhill for the Seminoles. Florida State simply could not get its running game together and really couldn't figure Florida out in that fourth quarter. This is a big win for Florida, and I know you posted something last night, and I think it's a very compelling argument, Dan. Right. If you want to pick your national championship teams based solely on resume. Right. It's very difficult to look at the Florida Gators. And by the way, I know I was a critic of Florida in light of Rightfully this. Rightfully so. We both were. Yeah. In light of this win, I, ha- I no longer have a leg to stand on with that argument. All right. I, I'm right. perfectly willing to admit that I was, I was wrong in that judgment because Florida had a big win here. I cannot figure this Gator team out at all, but the truth is that there is a impressive resume there. I think what, Four of the top twelve teams in the country mm-hmm. against Florida. That that's at least as of yesterday's rankings. Yes. Sure. So Florida has done very well for itself. It is a shame for them that both Alabama and Georgia will be playing for the SEC title. They now have no pathway to get to the national championship game. Certainly going to go to a big bowl game. The question is which one. Um, I. What do you think about Florida, Dan? It's um, it's a shame for them and uh, Florida State now. Not doing much for the ACC, right? <laughs> because that, I guess, in conjunction with Clemson's loss a little South later, Carolina, yeah. South Carolina, the ACC probably being liked less by computers than it had going into this weekend. But um, big one for Florida here, big one for Will Muschamp. But I don't really have much else to say. They just continue to surprise me. Yeah, uh, I, I like the offensive play calling uh, for the most part in that they were able to use misdirection in the.
All right, folks, hang on. We seem to have lost Dan. He'll jump back in, and we'll we'll pick up where we left off. Thanks. All right, Dan, are you back with us? Um, yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Oh, I like the lower third you had up there. Thank you. Um, I'll just I'll just start talking about Florida, Florida State, where I was before. Yes, sir. Where did, do you remember where I cut off? Because I probably don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, here, here was my general thought of Florida, Florida State. Um, love the offense, even though it was a big, dumb Will Muschamp offense in that they were able to use misdirection to spring Mike Gillisley free and have him do what very few, if any, running backs were able to do against Florida State this year. Love Florida State's defensive ends, though. Able to get to Jeff Driscoll. Um, but the the story of this game was, and this is something I talked about with Carson York, we do the hangout, the Oregon offensive lineman. Sure. Um, the big advantage for Florida was internally, inside of their defensive line, uh, at the defensive tackle position, the, the disruption that they were able to cause against the Florida State offensive line. You saw EJ Manuel. Granted, he was running more some, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a not-so-positive way, throwing off his back foot a lot. Uh, it was a game of turnovers that Florida, Florida won, as evidenced in the last play of the game with that pick six. Uh, Florida's basically too fast and too talented on defense to lose to a team that is as inconsistent as Florida State is offensively. Yeah. Florida's, Florida's basically Southern Notre Dame, if that makes any sense. I mean, you have a, lot, a ton of talents on offense, but some... Yeah underwhelming performances, but defensively, they're as strong as anybody does anything in the country, just like Notre Dame is on defense. Yeah, and Florida State could not get its running game going. That was right. That was a big deal because Florida State, we've been talking all year, Florida State in years past didn't have that rushing attack. Right. This season, it's been dynamic for most of the year. Florida was able to contain that, and that was a big part of the reason why they were able to hang with Florida State until the latter part of this game when they just sort of stormed into the lead and and eventually won this game. So a, a big one for Florida here, at the very least. Um, unfortunate that they can't get higher in the rankings. Right. I don't know if anyone really wanted to see Florida in the national championship. Uh, if you want to make the Notre Dame comparison, you could argue we're already going to see Florida in the national championship. That is true. Either Alabama or Georgia, but... Um, Big win for Florida here. Good one for Wolverine. Yeah, Florida deserving of being in a, a non-conference situation. If we just had a list of 25 teams in, ahead of us, in front of us, to rank what they've done this season on paper, and granted we know that they Louisiana, Lafayette, sure. uh, Missouri, games that they just played down to, Vanderbilt, they look sluggish at points um, against average to lower teams. But 
what they what they do when they play up to their opponents, it generally ends with them winning, and that's something that shouldn't be discounted. A, a really tough schedule that they were able to basically bury. So, would would love to see four eight teams that yeah. involve Florida and Kansas State and Oregon, but we have we have to wait a couple of years. Okay, Oregon. By the way, 48-24 over Oregon State in the Civil yep. War. Big numbers here. Worth noting, Oregon 570 total yards. Oregon State six turnovers. Mm-hmm. Typical Oregon game, Dan. Typical Oregon game if I've ever seen one. About a quarter, you know, to get the other team figured out and then just a slow burn until the game's out of hand. Kenyon Barner almost 200 on the ground, three touchdowns. D-A-T, D'Anthony Thomas. 122 three scores. Oregon did exactly what you and I expected in the Civil War. Here, Oregon, unfortunately, with Stanford's victory against UCLA, cannot win the Pac-12 championship, but will still likely play in a pretty big bowl game here. So a nice win on the road. Um, I Didn't mean a whole lot, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. It has to make you feel good about... Civil War always means a lot, Ty. Well, the Civil War means a lot, but I'm talking nationally speaking. Correct. Didn't really have much ramifications on anything going on outside of Corvallis. It is impressive to me, though, that Oregon finished out the season the way they did. A one-loss yes. season, um, probably Chip Kelly's last Civil War. In, uh, That's what in, it looks like. If, uh, if rumors are to be believed, but a nice win for them. And... Let, let me ask you this, okay? Let's, sure. let's shift gears because, again, 48-24, we're not going to really add much here. And it was 48-17 with like three seconds left, yeah. Sure. So garbage time touchdown makes it you know, 20, within 24. Yeah. We discussed this briefly on the Wednesday show. Mm-hmm. Who do you want as Oregon's next coach? Assuming Chip Kelly goes pro. And right. There seems to be a lot of smoke to that rumor. Assuming it happens, who do you want? Who, who's number one on your list to come in there and take over the Ducks? Mark Elfrich. Okay. Offensive coordinator for Oregon. He keeps momentum going. Uh, better chance of keeping recruiting classes together. Better chance of I you know I don't know the interpersonal dealings of the coaching staff, but one of the big strengths of Oregon. Did you just wash back water? Is that what just happened? No, no, no. it's ice cube. Okay, good. We're good. Um, the the big thing that Oregon has pointed to uh, for success is continuity of the coaching staff, which a lot of teams at the top can't claim and suffer because of losses and, and attrition. So. Yeah. Continuity would be huge. The continuity of the scheme and the system that Oregon runs, as gimmicky as you want to say it is, it is perhaps the most successful continuous offensive system in college football uh, as it stands right now on a high level. So, yeah, Mark Helfrich would be the one. A lot of people seem to like him very much. Uh, Oregon seems like it would be a destination job for him. He's a local uh, from Oregon. Um, has developed quarterbacks, big-time quarterbacks in the Pac-12, has done a good job, has been more empowered this season to be game-planning more. It appears that there is credence to the thought that Chip Kelly's big unfinished business thing yeah. was simply preparing the program for life beyond Chip Kelly, and that that's what Mark Helfridge would be. Okay. Well, um, 48-24, good way to go out the uh... – out uh, out the season, yes. Or, uh, Chip Kelly, if it's his last, uh, good riddance. He's done wonderful things at Oregon. It's a, sh- it's a shame they couldn't get back to the solid verbal Dan. It is a shame. I'm honest with you here. I, I'm I'm a little disappointed by that. I was I was pulling for Oregon despite all the gimmick comments and <laughs> and all the uh, all the hate spewn by you towards my Fighting Irish. Um, sure. I was I was very much rooting for. I, listen, I want I want D'Anthony Thomas to throw a block. <laughs> I want I want a kicker to make a field goal. I yeah. want I want running backs to not fumble the ball in the red zone. These are all things I want too, Ty. These are yeah. all things I want too. LSU twenty, Arkansas thirteen. The yeah. upset of the year right here was that Arkansas outgained LSU four sixty two to three oh six. It was apparent watching this one. Zach Mettenberger was just not as sharp as uh, as he was, let's say, two, three weeks ago. And, you know, in seeing his performances way back when, it feels like forever ago, Mm -hmm. it seemed as if LSU were a different team. This is the LSU that we we saw against Auburn. This is the LSU that we saw in spots this season that made us feel real tentative about picking the Tigers. So Zach Mettenberger, very, I don't know, shaky in this one, erratic, wasn't as sharp as he's been. Tyler Wilson, by the way, going out on a high note, Throwing for 359 in a losing effort. <laughs> Got to throw that one in there. But. Sure. 20 to 13, huh? The SEC, man. It's just, it's just 
It's, it's a war. Slobber knocker big boy football is what it is down there. Yeah, uh, LSU was, I mean, this was going to happen sooner or later. They, they were going to keep it up all season long. The game is in Fayetteville. This was the, the game Arkansas had circled as soon as they realized they weren't going to be all that good. At least maybe we can go out and take out LSU, something that they've done, by the way, recently uh, at home. So nothing, no, nothing too surprising here. Very cool to see LSU hang on, I guess, if you're an LSU fan. But, yeah, no, there was nothing completely huge about this game. Other than the fact that the defense played as well as the defense has been playing, and big in the red zone especially, and LSU moves on, probably not to – I'm not sure how it's going to work. I don't think LSU's going to be CS Bowl, right? I don't think so, no. They might go to, like, the Cotton Bowl or something. Right, it'll be Alabama and Florida if Alabama – it'll be it'll be whoever wins the SEC championship in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I would think. Yeah, I don't know. A weird year where you have teams as good as LSU and Georgia going to uh, a non-BCS bowl, but such is life in the all-empowered SEC. All right. Stanford 35, UCLA 17. Don't yeah. say, you didn't say it. Lock of the week. We waited until the last week of the regular season, or last week of most people's regular seasons, I should yeah. say. Um, to double barrel it up. Yeah, we double barreled. We 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 double locked it. Stanford minus two on the road against UCLA. We both saw a mismatch here. Yep. Stanford started pulling away in the second half. Of course, they will play a rematch next week, which is intriguing. A rematch. No, it's not for the Pac-12 <laughs> championship. A rematch between Stanford and UCLA. What do you think the point spread will be this time around? In if, Palo Alto. If it was two last week, what's the what's the seven spread? and a half? Seven and a half. I'm I'm still inclined to lock Stanford up. Yeah, well, it, I mean, there's part of part of people that think part of people. That's a weird way of saying it. Um, some people feel like, and I'm I'm in that bunch that UCLA didn't have to play for much, and in losing this game, they knew they wouldn't have to play Oregon, which perhaps could have been more dangerous going to Eugene for UCLA, especially after last year's matchup, than playing a Stanford team that has had its ups and downs this season, but has looked amazing this uh, this past month or so since they've gone to uh, Kevin Hogan, better sure. than Oregon, obviously. So um, there's screenings the rumor that UCLA didn't, or the, to the thought that UCLA didn't have a ton to play for, knowing that they would be in the, the Pac-12 championship game and could throw all their marbles at that, that matchup. So that UCLA perhaps called off the dogs a little bit, didn't want to show too much against Stanford, it's reasonable to think. It makes me want Stanford to win this game by even more points <laughs> just because that, I mean, to waste people's money and time seems dumb if that were the case. So if you're not a UCLA fan, you know, Stanford showed fight. Stanford wants, deserves to win the Pac-12. Let's go, go Cardinal. Why couldn't they just agree to make this the championship game? I have no idea. I mean, that would make some, too much sense, I suppose. But yeah, that's just not the way it works, Ty. I guess not. <laughs> Number nine, Texas A&M, 59, Mizzou, 21. Dan, they done tried to win Johnny Football the Heisman here. Yes, they did. They might just have done it. Um, 372, three touchdowns through the air, 67 yards, and two rushing touchdowns. I watched a little bit of this game, Dan. Mm -hmm. He looked like Fran Tarkenton out there. I mean, he has all season, but the way he's running out of arm tackles, he's got guys draped on his legs, mm -hmm. stepping out of tackles, making plays it's not always pretty and i'm damn near certain it's not scripted most of it isn't but he just he he has a nose for the end zone he has a nose for the guys who are open he just he just knows how to maneuver to extend plays and make things happen so it, again we're not big on the heisman on the solid verbal right at least i'm not you, you might be more into it than i am but which I, is why I'm voting for B.J. Daniels. I saw, big on the Heisman. I saw someone say that they're going to write in Mike Trout. Okay. Which would be intriguing. But Dude, you've got to pay attention to that war. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, it's intriguing to me that people wouldn't vote for Manziel just because he's a freshman. And I know right. there's, there's certainly an, an old school mentality amongst some of those who have won the award, some of the sports writers who feel it should go to an upperclassman, and, and that's fine. I think that's a horrible requirement for supposedly the best player in college football, especially in a day and age when most of the better guys go pro after three years. But um, I, I would vote Manziel, personally. I, I would vote Manziel. Things change over time, just like rankings change and just like opinions of teams change. 
Manziel wasn't a serious candidate for this Heisman until that Alabama game, but since then he's been magnificent. Mm -hmm. And in a year where there really isn't a clear front runner, I think he's about as good as it gets. So I, I, I would be perfectly willing to give a redshirt freshman the award and, and make some history. I'd be okay with it. If yeah. you want to convince me that Marquise Lee is a better singular football player, I could buy that. If you want to convince me that Manti Teo had more of an effect on a better team, sure. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to argue that. But what, what Manziel was able to do, the degree of difficulty in doing that in your first year in sure. the most difficult conference to put up those types of numbers, otherworldly numbers, uh, and to do it in such a, an entertaining way. Very yeah. easy on the eyeballs, the way he plays. Um, I would have no problem with him winning the award. There, there's nobody that stands out as, it, you know, if Notre Dame had a running back who was ridiculous, or if Alabama had a quarterback who was better <laughs> in bigger spots than A.J. McCarron, sure. I, could, I could buy it. But... I, you know, to, to do it on the stage that he did it on, I, you, when you say it's, there's an old school mentality, it is literally an old school mentality. It is writers and voters above the age of 55, 60. Yeah. That I think no, would be I, most responsible for keeping Manziel away from the trophy this year. Yeah. I don't like that at, at all. Um, it's a college football award. He's playing college football at a higher level than everybody. AM put up 647. All right. 650. Let's round up. Yeah. Against one of the better defenses, I think that most people probably don't know about. Mizzou is not bad on defense, actually. They're, they're, they're not horrible. Right. And, um, I guess that's, just... what's, that, that's what's going to be their recruiting pitch and on posters. <laughs> Mizzou is not horrible, guys. Mizzou is not horrible. More, more broadly, how scary is A&M for the next two years? Pretty scary. I think it'll be interesting to see what the offensive line looks like, looks like and develops as, and when Kevin Sumlin is able to bring in his own players, how he stocks that offense, how that defense is able to continue – to, to be also be underrated, being pressed into action as much as they are because Texas A&M will score pretty quickly. So that's the interesting thing. But, yes, they will receive the lion's share of, of off-season hype, and it'll be quite interesting to see now that Johnny Manziel knows he's good in college and has a whole off-season to think about that, how he responds. South Carolina, South Kakalaki. South Kakalaki. 27, Clemson, 17. South Carolina, Dan. Mm-hmm. Shuts down that Clemson, that powerful Clemson attack after Correct. giving up uh, 14 points in the first quarter. They hold Taj Boyd under a 50% completion rate. Taj Boyd, a guy, speaking of the Heisman, sort of a dark horse with the way uh -huh. he has performed after that Florida State loss. Taj Until Boyd. yesterday, yeah. Right. Taj Boyd has been incredible. Right. And then yesterday he wasn't. Actually, the most incredible quarterback in the game was Dylan Thompson for South Carolina. He threw for mm -hmm. three, three touchdowns. He looked really good. Indeed. South Carolina, another one of these SEC teams, Dan, I cannot figure out. For the life of me, I cannot figure this team out. You and I, I figured both, them out. You and I both picked Clemson here. We both like Clemson to cover. And South Carolina goes out there, and they, they put up offense. Um, was it that the Clemson defense is just so terrible? I think that's a possibility. But at the same time, Dylan Thompson looked – Looked like a, a passer we haven't seen all season from South Carolina. We've so, seen some of it from Dylan Thompson. We some. haven't. Right. Not he's been he's been pretty good. Not in right. In a, in a rivalry game on the road, it was fair, considering we didn't know Connor Shaw's status until pretty close to kickoff. Uh, it was fair to assume that Dylan Thomas, Dylan Thomas, Dylan Thompson would have a rough time with a, not a great Clemson defense, but a Clemson defense that has looked good at times this season. Sure. Um the big thing to me is Clemson not being able to control the ball at all, not being able to grind out tough yards. The offensive line has been inconsistent all year, or just not that good all year, but they've been bailed out by amazing skill players. And that's tougher when you play a team that has a front, a defensive front, as good as South Carolina's is. Um, the, as for figuring out who or what South Carolina is, South Carolina is almost as good as really good SEC teams. That's what they are. They're almost as good as LSU. They're not as good as Florida. Um, they're not as good as Alabama, but they're, they're in the conversation because of what they've been able to do. A big uh, non-conference, this is important, a big non-conference SEC win this season against a, a good Clemson team. Something that I don't know if we can always point to with the SEC. LSU beat Washington, Alabama beat Michigan, uh, ranked teams, but nothing not as good. Is this, I mean, who am I forgetting? Is this the SEC's primetime, prime, prime non-conference win of the season? If 
Florida didn't play anybody. LSU, Al Georgia. Alabama beat Michigan. That's right. Alabama beat Michigan. I'm more impressed by South Carolina going on the road and beating Clemson than beating Michigan on a neutral site. Yeah, no, this was a good win. I mean, right. say what you want about Clemson, but it's still a pretty good offense. Um, not sure. always the defense, but still, it, it's it's a pretty good win, especially on the road in a rivalry game. Yep. Um, this, this is an impressive win, so a good way to go out for South Carolina and what's been a, a, a weird year for the Gamecocks, i got to say. I, I think they're one of, what, six teams in the SEC to have ten wins? Something yep. like that. I mean, there are a number of teams with ten wins now. And um, South Carolina, you want to talk about going through the gamut of emotion. Um, you know, from, from the way the season started to the way it finished and certainly with the injury to Marcus Lattimore, it's, um, it's been one of ups and downs. So I guess from that, that standpoint, you have to be glad for the way they were able to finish strongly here against a, uh, a hated rival. So. Yeah, and, and going forward, the big thing, Dabo Swinney has been able to recruit skill players locally and in Florida and everything throughout the Southeast. Southeast? Southeast, but... What will he and his offensive and defensive line coaching staff be able to do in pulling? And we've seen Robert Candice or whatever. I really just don't follow recruiting all that much. But what can they do as for stocking depth on the offensive and defensive lines? That's going to be the difference between a Clemson team that loses to Florida State and South Carolina because of an inability up front to a team that will go to more BCS Bowls. All right. We must move quickly through a, a, a list of other games here, Dan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go rapid fire here. You can tell me if you saw any of these and what you thought. But right. Oklahoma, 51, Oklahoma State, 48 in overtime. Mm -hmm. This game was the exact opposite, I would say, of Nebraska-Iowa. <laughs> this is not the same sport. Landry Jones threw 71 times for 500 yards. I saw Bill Connolly from SB Nation posted that Oklahoma logged 44 first downs on offense in this one. Right, one by three. <laughs> That's an impressive offensive showing. It doesn't say much for the Cowboy defense, but... Sooner defense. Oh, I guess and Cowboy defense, yeah. Um, still, that's, uh, that's impressive, to say the least. So Yeah. Um, good season for Oklahoma with the Kansas State loss next week. They can win the Big 12 and perhaps face Oregon in the Fiesta Bowl, which, I mean, who doesn't love Oregon-Oklahoma matchups? If that happens, onside <laughs> kick after onside kick after onside kick, I want to see it. Um, uh, a story perhaps lesser told between Oklahoma and Oklahoma State is the fact that Oklahoma State, with all of the injuries, especially at the quarterback position this season and the up-and-down nature of their personnel situation, losing five-star, I think his name is Herschel Sims, the five-star running back they lost right. during the offseason. Sure. The fact, the coaching job that Mike Gundy and Todd Monk and the offensive coordinator did this season, Joseph Randall, a very quiet, outstanding season for the Cowboys. Clint Shelf, third-string quarterback going into the year has a nice day both through the air and on the ground and just not a nice day, nice season as he's had to take over. So um, they, they really, Oklahoma State was really outplayed in the Arizona game and the Kansas State game. But beyond that, they've been in every game or they've won every game against a really tough Big 12 uh, conference slate, especially offensively, to win those shootouts, to be able to get stops when they've needed stops. Uh, better than their record, I would say, Oklahoma State at this point. A very intriguing, and if not for Bill Snyder, probably coach of the year goes to Mike Gundy in the, in the conference. Ohio State 26, Michigan 21. Ohio State caps the perfect 12-0 and regular season, Dan. Yes. They are officially now the national champions of Ohio. Great, sure. Great honor. Denard Robinson plays his last home game. Does not throw one pass. Not home game. Does not throw one pass <laughs> again. It wasn't a home game. What am I saying? No, it was in Columbus, yeah. Road home game. Excuse me, folks. Yeah. Plays his last game without throwing a pass. Ran 10 times, 122 in a touch. If you missed the second half here, Dan, and I know you were busy. <laughs> if you missed the second half here, I wouldn't say you missed anything. This <laughs> is a horrible, no. very bad showing by Michigan offensively in the second half. Didn't run one singular play from Ohio State's territory. Ultimately, too many turnovers for Michigan. Four. Braxton Miller, 14 of 18 passing, 20 for 57 rushing. Carlos Hyde, a nice day on the ground. This was a really nice way for Ohio State to go out. Somewhere Gene Smith just checked into a safe house under an alias. You, you have to assume that much. We're taking the bull band this year, yeah. Ohio State finishes 12-0. and 0. I haven't heard bull much scuttlebutt for them. Being, uh, last year, yeah. I haven't heard much scuttlebutt for... Ohio State being a, a co-AP national champion. Right. I don't know if anyone's really talking about that, but 12-0 is a, is a really good start, one might say, for uh, 
the first year of the Urban Meyer era. 12-0 and 0 is a terrific start and a terrific um, story going into next year. I don't think it's anything beyond that. They're not playing in a bowl game. There's not too much to glean other than the fact that they were able to survive a lot of slop, which is actually the hallmark of an outstanding team, which Ohio State looked to be at certain times this year. It was an ugly game against Michigan. Michigan was ugly. The turnovers were killer for the Wolverines. Um, interesting, to see, interesting to see uh, how Braxton Miller looks, not just – because he's had an offseason with Urban Meyer, but how he will look with an offseason and looking at the tape and the mistakes he made and the things he did quite well and the evolution he'll have before his junior season and how much he's able to simply take what the defense gives him instead of trying to always get that big play. Um, that, I think, comes with maturity. And if that happens where he's able to both – uh, take the take the eight yard plays, take the four yard plays when they're there instead of always trying for seventeen. Uh, Ohio State's going to be damn scary next year. Very excited to see what the Buckeyes are able to do. Michigan, it was it was not meant to be this season. No, no, it wasn't meant to be. Um, okay, Nebraska thirteen, Iowa seven. <laughs> Sorry, four hundred and sixty three yards in this game. That's total, total in this game. No okay. highlights here. I have no highlights. You heard one of our verballers call in and say that he felt like putting glass in his eyes. I wrote to uh, Holly from, uh, from SI. Mm-hmm. Holly Anderson. Of course, we know Holly Anderson. I, I wrote to Holly from SI, and I, my joke was that originally this is they use footage from this game to uh, create the blind singing children in Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> God. Ty, that still hurts. That still Part stings. Game, so. Yeah. Anyway, Nebraska wins. They're going to play in the... Big Ten Championship next week. Yes, all, uh, Wisconsin winner goes to the Rose Bowl. Plays for all the roses. So. Um, for the right to be hopefully manhandled by Stanford. One would think. Okay. TCU 20, Texas 13. TCU beats Texas with a defense that I know you posted this. Featured zero players that were offered to play football at Texas. Nice, yes. Nice uh, shard of poetic justice there. Five or excuse me, four turnovers eventually sink Texas in this football game. Just when we thought they had started to turn some kind of a corner, it was not meant to be. Texas loses this one 20 to 13 here, Dan. I would just like to apologize on behalf of Jesse Palmer for the horns down. Yeah. That was totally in, and this is what he did. He did one of these and he just kept doing that. And it's totally inappropriate to do this. It's not respectful of the University of Texas. Right. Now, okay. with that out of the way. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't actually find out that it was zero players recruited by Texas. That was from our friends at uh, at what's it, Burn Orange Nation, Westcott Eberts. Uh, that's who found that out. Um, yeah, Texas. It was a story of quarterback regression and Case McCoy and David Ash both turning the ball over, not being able to consistently drive the ball down the field, and TCU's run defense, which we mentioned last week, being really good and unfortunately just had been playing a lot of teams that threw the ball a lot. But Texas, a team that does rely on the on the ground game for a lot of their success offensively, uh, they relied on Jonathan Gray to do not all that much. TCU did a very good job tackling in the open field, uh, erasing lanes, and going on the road to Texas in their first game against the Longhorns as a, a Big 12 member, and uh, and really ruining Thanksgiving for everybody in Austin. So a nice way... For TCU, uh, Texas now losing both to both TCU and West Virginia, the Big 12's new members. So, a lot of work to be done by Texas, but luckily they they'll be able to end the season with a, a very soft note with Kansas State and Colin Klein. Was or, it really that big of a deal that he did the upside down horns? I guess if ESPN has a deal with the University of Texas, it I seems mean, disrespectful. You got to be kidding me. I don't know. You know, you got guys on college game day giving fingers to the stands. You know, giving fingers to the cameras and. You're going to call Jesse. You have Stephen A. Smith using racial epithets. Right. And not having to apologize. You have Lee Corso dropping F bombs and apologizing, but a little bit different. This, yeah. These are hand signals. Who cares? Unbelievable. People are too sensitive nowadays. All right. Um, yeah. Ladies one other one quickly. We called this one. Chris the Capper also called this one. Pit 27, Rutgers 6. This was never even close. Rutgers right. will do just a shade over 200 total yards. So. Good win for Pitt here to uh, to close out the season. I want to go. Good point, that, good point that Rutgers didn't have a ton to play for, given that they were they, they were deciding the Big East against Louisville this coming week. Absolutely. All right. So yeah. quick ones, very quickly again. Penn State twenty four, Wisconsin twenty one in overtime. Big kick by Sam Ficken. Yeah. Cool, How about that for some comeuppance? How about it, man? Yeah, I like that. 
Bill O'Brien. I like when a kicker wins a game. I don't know. <laughs> Bill O'Brien definitely referred to his team as a bunch of effers. I don't know if you... Uh, yeah, uh, I saw that. I didn't see the clip. Definitely did it. Cool. He tried it, was to- in the, it was in the post game with the, the sideline reporter. Yeah, it sounded nice. like he wanted to say fighters, but the combination <laughs> of his dead voice after screaming all game, combined with his obvious emotion after winning the game, right? It's not wrong, and it was awesome. <laughs> uh, after what he's done this year, yeah, I'm okay with that. Perfectly okay with the slip like that. Penn State wins by three in OT. Washington <laughs> State wins the Apple Cup. Ooh, they outlast four turnovers in overtime. Win the cup at home. They intercept on the first play in overtime. He price pass. This was, uh, this was a big deal for Washington State, given some of the recent turmoil there. If Keith Price ever sprains his ankle, it will always be his back foot ankle. That yeah. guy, there is no pass he won't throw off of that foot. As soon as Washington actually gets some momentum and has a ranking next to their name, that's when they lose. They can't have nice things. That's, that's basically the Washington Husky MO of the recent the recent era. Um, Washington State, very nice job fighting back. They were down, I want to say, 28-10. They were down 18 points in the fourth quarter. Um, not a great day through the air, surprisingly enough, but able to get stops when they needed to get stops. They, they shut out Washington in the fourth quarter. They forced they forced turnovers. Really? Did you just yawn I'm at yawning. the Apple Cup tie? I'm yawning. Yeah, actually. no, that happens. Uh, a really unfortunate incident after. Did you see what happened after the game? Yeah. With Washington State rushing the field and Austin Safarian Jenkins, really good all Pac-12 quality tight end for Washington, gets punched. Yeah, Not okay, but does not define Washington State. Washington State, a lot of really good fans. It was just one outlying a-hole. So. <laughs> cool. Mike Leach's first conference win. And they're now not definitely worse than Colorado after even losing to Colorado. So. I mean, if you're going to punch somebody... I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah, that's just no. If you're gonna punch somebody, don't like bother punch, going to a college football game. Like punch me, or you punch me. Punch, punch someone who's, who's not six seven two sixty five. Yeah, generally not a winning strategy in life. But right, yeah. Okay. We all have different codes. Arizona State forty one, Arizona thirty four. Yeah. Rallies from a ten point third quarter deficit to win this one. They score twenty four in the fourth quarter. Nice day for Marion Grice. Mm-hmm. Matt Scott still does not look right. No. Still does not look right after the concussion, but uh, big win for ASU here. This is uh, the seventh win, I think, that gets them to 7-5 and five in, in Todd Graham's first year. That's a, that's a nice start for them. Very nice win to go on the road in the Territorial Cup. Uh, Marion Grice, they've, have all, they've used all sorts of running back talent this year, but the huge story, even... Do you, you have in a losing effort ready? Uh, I do. Kadeem Carey. It just feels right because it's Arizona, too. Right. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Through week 13, your nation's, not the Pac-12s, your nation's leading rusher, Kadeem Carey. An outstanding job done this season. Unbelievable. Um, Offensive line, not even a great offensive line. A lot of this is scheme. A lot of this is individual effort. Uh, A ridiculous running back that I hope we get to see a ton more of in the coming years. Still young, still an underclassman. Uh, Really, really, really fun to watch. Runs with speed, runs with power. Against an ASU defense that's been inconsistent, he, he played quite well. But um, one of the, the bright spots and a very good class of running backs in the Pac-12. Virginia Tech 17, oh. 14. Our pregame thought here was that Virginia Tech wasn't 10.5 points better than almost anybody in the country. Dan, Logan Thomas was awful. <laughs> awful. Throwing the football in this game. The former number one player on Mel Kuyper's base. With the first player chosen in the NFL draft. It's awful, not Logan Thomas, yeah. Awful throwing the football here. Much better rushing the ball. Mm-hmm. Much better rushing the ball. This is a tight game throughout. Played out exactly. I I don't know if anyone was surprised looking at the score, to be perfectly frank here. It, it it played out exactly what I would expect to see, exactly how I would expect a uh, a Commonwealth Cup game to play out at this juncture. Boy, really boy. piss poor clock management. That seemed oh. to be the consensus oh. <laughs> oh. from the from our Virginia fan listeners, from Mike London. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, still the bigger story in the ACC is Tom O'Brien is gone. Tom O'Brien's gone, yeah. Tom O'Brien. Kind of a surprise for people, I think. Yeah, kind of blindsided. I mean, NC State, you don't expect huge things year in, year out, and he's done a decent enough job, but they, they have aspirations of a, quote, bulldog recruiter, somebody that can bring more talent to Raleigh. So I don't know who that person is. Tom O'Brien to Boston College? 
<laughs> I mean, it worked the first time. Spaziani's probably gone. You have the solid verbal connection. Let's right. just make this real easy. Let's send O'Brien back. Let's get it all worked out in Chestnut Hill. And finally, the egg bowl for all the eggs. Yeah. And you don't just come into Oxford when all the eggs are on the line. The oxy, yeah. Mississippi curb stomps. Mississippi State. 41 24, Bo Wallace. 292 through the air, five touchdowns. Yep. Mississippi State has experienced a fall from grace that none of us saw coming. Um, Mississippi State, at one point, I think a top 15 team. Yeah. Well, they, they really hadn't played anybody. Yes, they were a top 15 team. Then they started playing their backloaded schedule. Top 15 team finishes eight. Can I, may I give you another two names? Sure. By all means. Do freeze. Done a great job. Um, he played hard. Who is the SEC coach of the year at this point in your mind? Well, since is Derek it Sumlin? Dooley, since Derek Dooley's fired. Oh yeah, that would have been my pick too. I think I think my front runner would probably be Kevin Sumlin. But Hugh Freeze has done has done a great job. I mean, with with the depth with how team, bad that team was last they, year, they have serious depth issues across the board. And right. The fact that he is getting this team to play as hard as it's played now. A couple weeks in a row, and they haven't always won, but um, the fact that he is getting this much out of that little, to me, is is really, really impressive. So he might not win the award, but I, he, he's done enough to to at least be a very serious contender for it, let's say. Uh, two big receiving names that perhaps people should know more of. Chad Bumpfus from Mississippi State had a very nice day. Dante Moncrief, sophomore for Ole Miss. Sure. Unstoppable. And these are really good Mississippi State Corners. I actually was watching this game. We had barbecue at a place called Moe's in Tuscaloosa with a million TVs. So that's where I watched part of the evening games. I was staring forward at USC Notre Dame, and the TV behind me was Mississippi, Mississippi State. And there was an old Miss. She was a fan of about, I mean, she's about 35, 40 years old. Okay. Um, after every play, it was spastic clapping. Dante! Dante! <laughs> Dante! So I started turning around and watching Dante. Ah, excuse me, Moncrief even more. Ridiculous. Very excited to see yeah. year two of Hugh Freeze in that offense. All right, Dan. Well, um, I, I think that does it for week 13. Notre Dame's going to the ship. They're going to play against either Alabama or it's Georgia. Andy. Yeah, that's the way it is. We're going to be there. You're, you just look so emotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emotionless almost. It's getting fired up for this, Dan. I'm trying, I'm trying to be <laughs> objective here. Right. Why? Maybe on the Wednesday show, I'll, I'll give you more of a glimpse into the uh, the evening that was here on Saturday night. But right, um, big win for the Irish. I, you know, I'm I'm trying to avoid being too optimistic and too excitable about this because I know they're going to have to play the SEC champion, and that that is a tall order. And there are a lot of Notre Dame fans that listen to the show. I would urge Notre Dame fans not to be drawn into the whole if Notre Dame were in the SEC type stuff or right. is Notre Dame overrated type stuff. All those arguments go out the window. All right, people can make those arguments, but the truth is, then Notre Dame's going. Yeah, Notre Dame is going there. They're going to have their chance to prove whether or not they're worth it on January seventh, and you can honestly just defer until that point. I am very interested in seeing it as a college football fan, and I, I, I. I Cannot stress enough that there's no reason for Irish fans to be overconfident headed into any of these games. Right. This is going to be a tall order. It's going to be very difficult to be either one of these two teams. So I have my own reservations about why I don't think Notre Dame is as good as Alabama. Obviously, it would be a better game against Georgia, but um, we shall see. We shall see. So before we go, I do need to point this out. You've heard of the Herbies, but have you nominated for the fourth annual Verbies? The Solid Verbal wants your suggestions for the most prestigious award show in all of college football podcasting. Hosted by two random guys on the internet. Head out to solidverbal.com today. Be a part of history. All right. You heard the man. Yes. Solidverbal.com. Be a part of history. Dot com. We have a new category, which we're going to be adding to the queue this evening. You can nominate for the Jake Locker Worst Year Back Award. <laughs> now you'd have to assume it goes to Matt Barkley or Landry Jones, but uh, it is the player who has done the most to reduce his draft stock the most. <laughs> The most to re... Oh, Jake Locker didn't really reduce his draft stock, just was disappointing in a senior year. 
He didn't elevate it. I can tell. Didn't you that. elevate it. That is true. Yeah, I guess people said that he would be the number one overall pick, and this is the same people that love Logan Thomas. Number one. Can we go back? Remember, there was when Logan Thomas started out last season. It was the meme on him. The narrative on him was converted tight end Logan yeah. Thomas. Right. Can we go back to that? Yeah. Does it make sense to stop calling him quarterback Logan Thomas and just like converted tight end Logan Thomas? I don't know. I like that. He's been awful, but yeah, there you go. Uh, Jake Locker, worst year back, a number of other awards that you can also vote on. So, okay, Dan, you look tired. I am tired. I, I know you've been uh, you, you've been doing the SB Nation thing out and about. So, are, are we going to be in the studio next week? Is We're that- going to be in the studio next week. Yeah. Are you going to come Saturday for the final? I might. I might have Saturday this season. Yeah, I might do that. We're going to have some special guests. Okay. Yeah, I might do that. We'll see. I would love to see your face. That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> all right. For that guy over there at his home, get some sleep, Dan. Yeah, it'll happen. For myself, Ty, here in beautiful Allentown. Thanks for tuning in with us. Thanks for all of your reverbs. Appreciate it. Solidverbal at gmail.com. 206-338-1784. Hit us up on the Twitter and the Facebooks. We will be by a little later on this week to preview some of the action and talk a little more in-depth about some of the bowl games and some of the other news and notes in and around the world of college football. In the meantime, thanks again for tuning in. By all means, stay solid. Catch you all in a bit. Peace!